I'm happy to introduce Scott Fallman, Professor Emeritus at CMU, um, PhD in AI from MIT, good friends with Clyde, interested in AI, planning, knowledge representation and reasoning, image processing, natural language processing, and everything. I hand it over to you, Scott. Hey Scott, do you want me to interrupt you when you've got five minutes and save five minutes for questions? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, okay, take it away. Okay, thank you, and you're seeing the title slide. Okay, uh, well, greetings from Pittsburgh where it's uh, three in the morning. Uh, but while we're staying up for uh, to hear some of these talks. Uh, I'm an emeritus professor, which in my case means that I'm formally retired, but I'm still doing research, still uh, advising some student projects. And I'm writing a book uh, on the research I've done over the years. Uh, the title is Knowledge-Based Artificial Intelligence common sense, language understanding, and the meaning of meaning. So very modest title, but I'll, uh, I'll try to live up to it. The main premises of the book are that for human-like AI, we will need both a database deep learning component and a symbolic knowledge-based component, each doing the jobs that it does best. And the second premise is that there's a lot more life left in the symbolic knowledge-based approach than most AI researchers have come to believe. Everyone thinks now that it's all uh, machine learning and, uh, and data-driven rather than knowledge-driven. Uh, I should say that the people at this conference may be the exceptions, uh, many of them. Uh, and I think Ron Son and some of the others have made the case for the first premise pretty well. So I'll move through that quickly. Uh, for human-like AI, we need both kinds, and uh, I think the division that I have in mind is pretty similar, although it differs in some details, to Daniel Kahneman's fast and slow systems. Again, Ron Sun just talked about that, so uh, um, I'll just move right past that. Uh, the machine learning, deep learning component Scott, is meant I to handle you low briefly? level. In are you sharing slides because we're not seeing? Oh, no. Uh, I'm trying to. Let me. Our screen. Share. Uh, security, privacy to grant access. All right. Can you, one second. Is that working now? Yes. 
Okay, good. Let me uh, get the right stuff in front. All right, so you can see the uh, slide now, right? Premise yes, we number can. One? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, these uh, intercontinental uh, sharing can get complicated, I guess. Uh, so we need both the database deep learning component and symbolic knowledge base component, each doing the jobs that it does best. Uh, I think the ML machine learning deep learning component is very good for handling low level input output processing, recognition, you know, this is a cat, reflex actions, uh, this is a bear run away, and probably language up to the level of syntax. Um, I don't think it's good at capturing the meaning of language. The symbolic component handles higher level cognition, complex planning, language understanding at the meaning level, and language generation at the meaning level. Uh, you can force each component to do some of the jobs of the other, but uh, you will see that it's really fighting you. It's making the job difficult. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, trying to use a deep learning component like a large language model to capture meaning is really the wrong tool for the job. It can be done, but it's very difficult. Oh, no. All right. So the large language models are surprisingly good. Uh, they're generating a lot of excitement, but they don't really understand anything. Again, the previous, uh, previous speakers have made this point. Um, the models are inscrutable and that creates a lot of social problems. Uh, we don't know where the answers came from. They hallucinate and make errors no human would ever make. They can be trained, but they can't learn by simply being told something or by asking or by looking it up. You have to build a data set and retrain them in general. And for anything approaching human-like common sense, they must ingest far more text than any human child or adult has ever read and uh, heat up the planet and, and burn uh, enormous amounts of compute cycles. So uh, it's a solution, but it's not a great solution. Uh, I'm gonna skip this. Premise number two, uh, there's a lot more life left in the symbolic knowledge-based approach than AI people have come to believe. Uh, a lot of people think that, well, as awkward as it is, the large language models are the only game in town. And uh, I'd like to examine where that came from. Researchers in the 1980s made very slow progress with symbolic knowledge-based AI. It was frustrating. For human-like common sense, we need an enormous amount of knowledge, uh, seemingly almost infinite. Uh, and rule-based and logic-based systems didn't scale up well. To put the knowledge into these things was very labor-intensive. You needed logicians, you needed ontologists, you needed expert programmers to make the rules. Uh, getting the knowledge in was very slow. You couldn't just tell it things. So researchers and funders finally gave up on this and came to believe it failed. And ever since then, machine learning has been the dominant way of doing AI. Uh, then came neural nets, then came deep learning nets, then came large language models. But I think uh, if we go back and re-examine the approach that people were taking to the knowledge-based AI, uh, Perhaps if we dump the formal logic, formal logic and theorem proving, which both made things awkward, hard to represent, and uh, very slow for the inference, uh, and just focus on how to say precisely what we need to say, all the different things we can say with natural language, and then make the runtime inference really fast. There's knowledge you put into the machine explicitly, and that creates an enormous amount of, of potential knowledge, of, of implicit knowledge. Uh, and I believe the way to get around the scaling problems are to leave the implicit knowledge in implicit form. 
We don't do knowledge discovery. We don't try to make it all explicit. So a key concept, uh, and this is something I was playing with back when I was a PhD student in the 1970s, is what I was calling a virtual copy. Suppose I tell you that Clyde's an elephant. You now know a lot about Clyde, and I didn't tell you any of that. You know that Clyde is gray. You know that Clyde has two eyes, probably. Uh, you know that uh, what it means that those eyes are open or closed. Uh, that Clyde has a heart, that Clyde needs air, oxygen, and so on. You're using a lot of background knowledge and inference to get this information about Clyde, because I didn't tell you that. So concepts are mostly not defined, but each concept, like elephant, I is represented uh, as a description of the typical member of the class. So uh, it will have roles in fillers, like color is gray. It will have structures, like the parts of the elephant, how they connect. It will have statements about the typical elephant, uh, that they like peanuts. Uh, it will have is a links to other classes like mammal and uh, herbivore, and it inherits knowledge from all those superior classes. So when I say Clyde is an elephant, you're getting the composite description of all the things that are above Clyde in the is a hierarchy. That's what we want to happen. And the problem is, this is the brain inspired bit, We've got millisecond neurons. How are we going to make that uh, fast enough? We don't want to make all this knowledge explicit. We want to leave it implicit and deduce it when a query comes in, when we need it. So the amount of implicit information is much larger than the amount of explicit information. And this is a key to scalable knowledge representation and reasoning. But it requires very fast um, very fast inference at query time. So how are we going to do that? Uh, we want complex descriptions, millions of explicit nodes and links, and the implicit knowledge is much larger than that. Uh, in the meantime, we're doing this with human brains with millisecond speed components. That's the intrusion of neuroscience into all this. Uh, and the answer must be large scale parallelism. That's the only possible way to get that much computation done uh, with millisecond speed components. So imagine we build a machine uh, where every node and every link in your semantic network and your knowledge base is actually a hardware element. It's got storage for a few marker bits and it's got some wires for connecting to other things. So the nodes represent entities, the links represent statements about them or structural things like X is the Y of Z. As we learn new things, we wire them up and we could solder them together, but it's more practical to do it via a switching network. And uh, the hypothesis is that somehow the neurons are getting that job done. Uh, but let's, uh, let's look at the model and see what it can do. Uh, in the meantime, off to the side somewhere, there's a serial control computer that's shouting orders to the entire ensemble. Okay, it's the, uh, I was calling that the consciousness box, but that always starts a fight. But this is the uh, serial component that's running this huge memory with the built-in marker passing inference. So suppose you want to know what color is Clyde, and I told you Clyde is an elephant. Well, let's minutes. allocate marker bit M1, clear it from all the elements. So the control computer says, all you elements out there, clear marker bit M1. Clyde node, set marker bit M1. And then we're going to do what I call an upscan. We're going to tell every is a link, if it's got M1 below it, to set M1 on the node above it. And if they all do that at once, you've gone one level up the ISA hierarchy, no matter how big the branching factor is. Clyde is a lot of different things, maybe a male and a circus performer. You've marked all those things. You do it again and again and again until you get to the thing node at the top, thing node at the top. And 
you've marked now with M1 the entire set of things that Clyde is supposed to inherit, the entire set of descriptions of which it's an instance. Okay, and now you can say to the entire set of M1 marked elements, uh, all your M1 nodes, uh, if the, any of you has a color of link, uh, put M2 on the other end of the color of link. And uh, if everything has gone well, that will be the answer. The gray node gets M2 from one or more places. And uh, that's your answer. So report yourself into the control computer and uh, you've done this piece of inference. Uh, now that's very quick kind of hand-waving explanation. Uh, you can go read my thesis uh, or you can wait for the book to come out and you'll see all the gory details. Uh, you have to deal with uh, general statements with exceptions and all sorts of other things. Uh, you can do a lot with this kind of a uh, massively parallel symbolic Boolean marker passing architecture. Uh, if elephants in general are gray, you can say that. And then if Clyde happens to be white, you can cancel that for Clyde alone. It sends a cancel M1 marker up to the color is gray link. And now you can say color is white without getting a conflict. You can implement split sets. So you have like animal, vegetable, mineral. Okay, if you're any one of those, you can't be any of the others. You can have male, female. Uh, and now there are several other recognized categories. Uh, but you can't be more than one of those at a given time. Uh, you, can ha you can be... Uh, well... A any of the sets, different models of cars. Uh, you can be an artificial device versus a natural device. Uh, another thing you can do is down scan. You go down the ISO links the other way and you can use this to mark the set of all large things, the set of all large animals, the set of all gray things, the set of all herbivorous animals. And then you can say, uh, okay, all you nodes, uh, if you've got marker one, two, three, four, and five, you're still in the game. Okay, you're still a candidate. If there's only one of you, you're the winner. You're the very large gray herbivorous quadruped animal in Africa. Um, so the down scan is a way of doing uh, recognition of a symbolic kind, not the kind that the neural nets do with the, with the numerical features. And we need both kinds of recognition. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I need, uh, you know, a fast car made in America, you know. Scott, I'm and, afraid we're going to have to uh, wind down and jump. Okay, uh, one more slide. Uh, it allows us to implement multiple context mechanisms which allow multiple overlapping world models in the same knowledge base. And that's very important. That's used in a million ways, but especially for indicating different states of the world at different times, episodic stuff. And I'll just say that we couldn't implement this when I got to CMU. I made a design. Uh, it would have been very expensive. I did other things for a long time. When I came back, uh, I realized that hardware is now cheaper and we could actually implement this nettle machine for say a million explicit facts. But we didn't need to do that. Machines are now a million times faster than when I was in grad school and memories were a million times larger. So Scone is an open source, all software implementation of the old nettle idea. It's using high speed hardware uh, on a serial machine to simulate slow, massively parallel machine. And uh, this is open source software. Uh, the book is coming soon. And if you want to learn more, uh, here's a couple of places where you can do that before the book comes out. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. That's the fastest I've ever tried to explain this. <laughs> but, uh, I hope you got something from it. 
Do we have any questions? Yes, thank you. And uh, I suppose this, uh, this kind of parallel logical inference um, can be done on GPU now, not on different machines, but on GPU. A GPU is wasted because there's, there's no flops here. There's no floating point arithmetic. There's no dot products being computed. So you certainly could build a chip that's parallel, and I've talked to Intel and some other companies about what it would take to do that. Uh, you could make good use of any multi-threading you have, but you really, it's zero flops. It uses no floating point arithmetic at all for this part of the thing. Now, for the recognition, you need that if you're still using neural nets. I see. Thank you. Okay, given that we're a, a bit behind, uh, I think we should move on to the next speaker.